Lecture two of the Brain Intelligence Communication and Consciousness BIX lecture at the University of Tokyo, 2022. Uh, uncertainty, emotion, and the world. Now, uh, everyone knows that Charles Darwin is the go-to man who, when it comes to the uh, problems of biological evolution. But did you know that um, Charles Darwin is also the go-to person when it comes to emotion? Uh, this is uh, the great work of his, the expression of the emotions in man and animals. In it, he starts from the study of the anatomy of the facial muscles, then goes on to the study of expressions of emotions in animals. Now, you can see many um, common features uh, with, with these expressions and um, uh, human expressions, but uh, in particular, it's quite interesting that in the case of the cat-like animal in the middle, uh, the bodily expression of emotion is very important, and which might be actually true in humans too. So when we study human emotions, we should take note of the bodily gestures, and these are the photographs that Charles Darwin referred to in his book. And, you know, for me, uh, this seems to be really uh, theatrical. Maybe one of the reasons why is that at these times, uh, the time required for a subject to pose before the camera was much longer than compared to the contemporary camera. So that's why probably these people, why these people are, you know, posing like in a theater. Anyway, um, I must protest to Mr. Charles Darwin for the description of the relationship between insanity and hair. <laughs> It has nothing to do with the hair, Charles. But anyway, he's a great man. And I always love the concluding remarks of Charles Darwin. I really admire that. And the concluding remarks of the expression of the emotions is beautiful. But I should say the number one prize should go to the concluding remarks of the origin of species. There is a grandeur in this view of life with its several pearls having been originally breathed into a few forms or into one. And that, whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. What a finishing touch to his magnum opus. I was fortunate enough to be uh, have um, as my mentor Horace Barrow, um, who was Charles Darwin's great-grandson, in Cambridge University, uh, UK, and this picture was taken circa 1993 when I was at the Chiba Foundation meetings and I am um, with Horace discussing over grasses of sherry and, you know, these were the time. And so Horace Barrow was a really wonderful person, a great grandson of Charles Darwin. Anyway, um, so we should take note that emotion can entail unconscious processing, whereas the conscious manifestations of emotion can be grasped into the in the feeling. So this book by Joseph Butu, a wonderful book by uh, this um, pioneer in uh, emotional study, uh, The Emotional Brain, uh, describes more or less unconscious manifestations of emotion, whereas Antonio Damasio's The Feeling of What Happens uh, investigates uh, the nature of conscious experience related to emotion. The, now, the modern approach to emotion is based on factorial analysis, and, you know, we talk about perceptions and cognitions related to emotions, and this is one of the standard model, a uh, general emotion model, uh, as presented in on the home pages of uh, University of Geneva. These are really wonderful, but I should say at the same time that in order to implement it into artificial systems like the robots and artificial intelligence, we need dynamical models. So we should establish a link between perception and dynamics. You know, perception is about how we perceive emotions and we, we can apply factor analysis and so on. But at the same time, we should have internal behind the door dynamics. Otherwise, we can't have a full description of emotion. Anyway, um, amygdala is the center of emotion, as you know, and it is one of the hubs of inf information processing in the brain. And emotion, in a sense, is a strategy to cope with uncertainty. And of course, uncertainty can have negative effect, but others like uh, in anxiety and fear, 
but uh, in other circumstances, it can be associated with positive effects, like hope. And uh, dopamine is heavily involved in this. Um, dopamine um, can code for reward structure as well as for actions, prefrontal cortex and striatum. And dopamine is involved in the reinforcement learning, um, where a neural activity is prior to the release of dopamine, which is the reward, uh, is reinforced in terms of synaptic connections. And this is very important, and uncertainty is heavily involved in this. So, as Daniel Kahneman pioneered, humans do not uh, necessarily behave in a economical relation way, which led to the field of behavioral economics and now neuroeconomics. And so, it's, uncertainty is the name of the game. And in the development of child, uh, it is very important to have the secure piece as pioneered by uh, the attachment theory by John Bowlby. And in parenting, it is very important to uh, provide secure piece for exploration for children. It is not a good idea to exert too much influence on protection, or it is not a good idea to um, abandon the child so that you don't notice that the child is left on the outside with a cockpit and it is too late because the plane is just leaving. This is disaster. Uh, in reinforcement running, uh, it is very important to strike a balance between exploration and exploitation. And this is a really important theme, both theoretically and also practically in our everyday lives we should uh, strike a balance between exploration and exploitation. So in terms of theoretical framework, uh, a general uh, you know, model is a multi-armed bandit uh, problem. And so we have a lot of sort machines and we don't know the natures of them. Uh, uh, some of them might uh, uh, you know, uh, lead to really big jackpot, but we don't know the details. So this is a situation that we are facing in reinforcement learning. Uh, in the exploration and exploitation trade-off. And so this is really interesting. And one of the ways to cope with uh, the multiple um, bandit problem is to uh, go for trap lining. Uh, it's a feeding strategy and in which you, you, know, you visit uh, potential feed food sources in turn and in a regular repeatable sequence. And this is actually performed by these wonderful creatures as a hummingbird because for hummingbirds uh, it is costly to hover and go from point to point so it is it makes sense to you know go for a regular line of you know, uh, food searching. And uh, there are ways to uh, study this uh, using artificial flowers. And it is very interesting that, you know, sometimes intruders would come from the wild. And, you know, it is uh, the knack, it seems, of for these researchers to have a really interesting mix between trained uh, herd of uh, hummingbirds and the intruders. This is the same situation. Uh, this was the same situation when I visited the Conrad Lawrence uh, Reservoir in Austria. Uh, you know, the famed uh, animal ethologist. Um, and it, um, you know, it, it was interesting to see uh, the population of wild geese mingling with um, domesticated uh, geese population at that uh, station. I, I am sure it's still going on business, and it was really. Uh, you know, inspirational to you know visit that station and see that mixture of wild and domesticated 
uh, populations, and you can apply Markovian chain analysis to the analysis of drop riding and other uh, strategies. And in the analysis, uh, in this paper, they talk about three uh, di different uh, strategies, the root development strategy and top lighting strategy, which is a final form, I think, and the nearest visits strategy, NNV strategy. So as time goes by, if you look at H, uh, figure 2H, um, eventually the top lining uh, strategy would become dominant, but in the meantime, uh, the root uh, exploration uh, behavior is important. But at the beginning, uh, NNV strategy becomes dominant. So this is quite an interesting shift in the hummingbirds uh, behavior. Now, um, of course, there are many interesting studies concerned about uh, behavior and emotion. And one of the interesting things you, you can talk about is the fight or flight, uh, you know, dilemma or um, choice. And uh, as we all know, uh, the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system is involved in the fight or flight response. And it is quite interesting to study these things because, you know, nowadays we talk about the brain cut axis and it is very much, uh, you know, related to the awareness of a human being. And too much fight or flight uh, response can lead to stress, but uh, it is something that is necessary in our everyday life. So it is very important uh, to study these things. And at the same time, it, the game theory uh, product is interesting, and we will discuss more and more uh, in later lectures. But um, you know, it is this idea that uh, there are inter interactions between agents, and uh, each agent trying to do his or her best to optimize reward. And this is a really interesting general framework to understand what's going on in the environment. So in this complex interaction, the prefrontal cortex modulated emotions uh, generated in amygdala. So it is very important to uh, study the prefrontal cortex uh, function. And this is a meta-analysis of the literature. And there are many regions involved in the prefrontal cortex to modulate emotion. And, uh, you know, so this interplay between amygdala and prefrontal cortex is one of the highlights, I think, of uh, studying uh, emotion in humans. Um, there are applications to psychotherapy too, and um, dopamine is involved in fear extinction therapy. So this is practically very important when people are obsessed with a certain uh, stimulus uh, from the environment because of past experiences. It is sometimes important to extinct, uh, extinct that fear uh, because it can be practically you know, uh, troublesome. And so this is a really interesting application of neuroscience. Uh, the interesting uh, relationship between choice and emotion. And in terms of making a choice at the winner-take-all mechanism uh, implemented in the basal ganglia is really important. And so these uh, motor-related uh, uh, pathways involving basal ganglia and striatum are very important issues to study. Mm. Um, of course, uh, choice is made in the social context and nothing could be understood uh, outside of the social context. So all these brain circuits involved, called the predominant and so on, these can function only in relation to uh, social context. So the brain in a cell, in a sense, is a really great machine to implement social context within each individual. Now, um, music is a very effective tool to study uh, emotion, uh, Hans Christian Andersen said, where words fail, music speaks. And Bono said, music can change the world because it can change people. And Douglas Adams said, uh, Beethoven tells you what it's like to be Beethoven, and Mozart tells you what it's like to be human. Bach tells you what it's like to be the universe. Beautiful words of wisdom. Now, um, this is a recent uh, study. Uh, it studied how uh, the you know, ex subjective experience invoked by music can be analyzed in terms of 13 distinct varieties of um, emotions. And uh, they actually did a really interesting study of compa comparing 
uh, of uh, the reactions between of people in the United States and China. Now, a pet can be uh, used in effective ways because nowadays uh, functional MRI is uh, kind of ubiquitous, but PET can study the way dopamine is uh, bound to its receptors, and for that we use a radio isotope of barcopride, and it um, can you know it it is a, a dopamine receptor antagonist, and it, it can provide uh, essential information. On how dopamine is released when listening to music, and the, the, so through these studies, uh, researchers have studied uh, the particular effect that music has on the brain, human brain, and this is my favorite uh, study. And uh, by the uh, people in Montreal, uh, they studied how uh, subjective reports of chills uh, induced by music. Uh, correlate with uh, brain activities, and what they found was very really interesting because even if you listen to an identical uh, piece of music, uh, people's reaction can be different. So, m emotion is a terribly uh, subjective uh, matter. I mean, it doesn't happen to other things. For example, if you look at this uh, raw thing, the, the brain reaction in the visual cortex would be pretty much the same from people to people. But if you listen to music, then uh, the emotion-related uh, neural activities in people are markedly different. So this is a really beautiful study. Now, uh, because music is culture, it is always evolving. And this is now discontinued, I think, uh, Google's music timeline. And it shows how the different genre of music has uh, have evolved um, over the years. and. So we are always exposed to new music, and it's interesting to study how the brain processes new music and find uh, value uh, in it. And um, so the conclusion is that uh, activity is in the right nuclear accumbens and right codeate and uh, dorsal striatum, uh, which is a lot of, uh, part of the dorsal striatum, accounted for 33% and 10% of the perceived value of new music. Um, so. This is quite interesting, I think, and because you know, news, music is about repetition, but music is also about uh, novelty. Now, regrets, I've had a few, but then again, too few to mention. Of course, this is my way, lyrics by Paul Anka. Um, in the study of multi armed bandit problems in reinforcement running, uh, they define. Uh, a quantity called regret in this way, and interestingly, um, you know, regret is a comparison between the fact and the counterfact. And so this is a counterfactual thinking, and using brain region uh, patients, uh, they have identified the that the orbital frontal cortex is a region involved in the processing of regret, which compares the factual and the counterfactual. So this is the Iowa gambling task, and using this, uh, you know, we can study regret, and people with intact orbital frontal cortex can tell the good decks after 40 to 50 trials. So this is a really, really, really typical um, example of the multi-armed bandit problem. And, you know, so people can study uh, the brain and using uh, these uh, setups and the regret uh, in which you uh, regret your choice and because you have lost and uh, the rejoice you feel uh, because in which you have made the correct choice. Both activities are distributed across the orbital frontal cortex. And so orbital frontal cortex is a really important area and orbital frontal cortex doesn't code for reward per se, but it calls for a really sophisticated information processing, depending on uh, specific outcomes, uh, guiding behavior and learning. So this is a case where the factual and the counterfactual are bind, bound together. So, you know, I, I think it is a, a very interesting aspect of human uh, experience that we always involve ourselves in counterfactual thinking. And this is my favorite study. Uh, uh, it tells how we can tell a part 
reality from fiction, like uh, the difference between Cinderella, which is a fictional person, and George Bush, uh, who is a famous real person. And they have shown that the default mode network is involved when, in, when telling reality and fiction. So there are many functions attributed to default mode network. But I, I think one of them is that uh, through the couple, coupling uh, with sensory motor contingencies, it can tell whether something is a fiction or a reality. So in a sense, reality is an embodied form of fiction. I think, and in you know controlling emotion and making it robust, uh, the prefrontal cortex is playing a really important role, and where logic is processed. So, in this particular uh, research, they studied how uh, the brain processes logical validity, and they found that the prefrontal area uh, is correlated with the perception of validity of logic, and so this is all quite interesting. So, you know, we are now talking about uh, how we can, you know, face uh, the really interesting mixture between the factual and counterfactual. So this is all about contingency. And uh, emotions such as anger, fear, and proactivity, uh, these can be modeled uh, using a contingent model. And in logic, uh, of course, we have model logic. Um, you know, uh, for example, uh, in classical logic, uh, two plus two equals four is a true statement, and two plus two equals five. That is a false statement, and these are not contingent on the real world situation. However, France is a public is a statement that is contingent on uh, the real situation. So. You know, when we deal with statements uh, that is contingent on the situation and the world, the, these are the model logic, and this is quite interesting. And you know, um, so emotion and contingency are really closely coupled, and uh, so we are dealing with the interplay between the factual and the counterfactual. When it comes to this, uh, Henri Bergson would be the go-to person. He won the Nobel uh, Prize in Literature in 1927, and Annie Bergson talks about contingency in length in his um, works such as Creative Evolution. So this is a hugely influential writing, and I recommend it to read it if you have time. Now, um, Henri Bergson, of course, is very important in that he proposed and discussed the concept of pure memory. Uh, I would have more opportunity to talk about this later in this lecture series when I focus on consciousness. Uh, when we talk about contingency, we of course we cannot go without mentioning the many words interpretation of quantum mechanics. And you know, this is from a uh, recent new scientist article, I think. And, you know, um, so people talk about multiples and, you know, people talk about uh, the world splitting into different, uh, you know, multiverses depending on the outcome of quantum measurement. And this is really far-fetched, I admit. But you should also know that this is a kind of a standard interpretation uh, where the proponent is a really respectable physicist, uh, including, I think, David Deutsch. So, you know, this is a, quite something to consider. F more, on a more philosophical tone, we can talk about possible worlds, and here quite, it's quite interesting to uh, discuss the optimism of Gottfried Leibniz, because he talked about this idea uh, that we are actually living in the best of all possible worlds. Now, this is quite interesting. And Leibniz said, basically, that um, it was not in God's power to create a perfect world, but among possible worlds, he created the best. So this world, with a lot of uncertainties and, you know, tragedies and tears and deaths and disappointment, uh, this is actually the best of all possible worlds, according to the logic of uh, Gottf Gottfried Leibniz, as uh, uh, you know, put forward here. So I, I personally think this is quite interesting, and um, you know, 
Voltaire was, of course, a um, really great man in the age of enlightenment, and he was a guy who, you know, kind of spread this rumor that Sir Isaac Newton uh, thought of gravitation when he saw an apple falling down from the tree. And um, Voltaire wrote this magnum opus uh, story, Candide, and in which the young man, Candide, is living under the protection of a Leibniz and optimism uh, proponent mentor, Professor Pangros, in the sort of the Garden of Eden situation. But gradually, uh, Candide realizes that this world that we live in probably is not so good as uh, Professor Pangros is uh, saying. And there's this uh, you know, gradual disillusionment and the realization that the world is not really, um, you know, idealistic uh, place, and which is quite an interesting and poignant uh, exposition of the human situation. So, Voltaire uh, in, encountered the nineteen fifty-five Lisbon earthquake, in which many people were killed by uh, collapsing buildings and tsunami. And uh, this, it is said, that shattered Voltaire's belief in philosophical optimism. And he even wrote a poem uh, inclined towards philosophical pessimism and deism uh, called Poem sur le de Lisbon. So we, you know, think uh, what is the world actually? And, you know, some contemporary philosophers even say that the world doesn't exist. Uh, most notably, Marcus Gabriel. Um, he said that everything exists, even the unicorn exists, even a unicorn with a police uniform on the dark side of the moon exists. However, everything exists, but the world does not exist. So this is quite interesting. What is the world? And of course, Ludwig Wittgenstein, in his Tractus Logico Philosophicus, uh, you know, put forth this. Uh, propositions about the world, and at the end, of course, he said, "Well, of one cannot speak; thereof one must be silent." So maybe we cannot speak about the world, and we must be silent about the world. But I don't know. Now, uh, Schopenhauer uh, was opposite to Leibniz, and he was an advocate of philosophical pessimism. Pessimism, and in his magnum opus, "The World as Will and Representation." He argued that the world is a miserable, miserable place with a lot of, you know, uh, pains and sorrows and so on. So he, finally, he argues that the world's non-existence would have been preferable to its existence. So this is a really extreme way of putting your philosophical uh, pessimism. And of course, Richard Wagner uh, composed Tristan and is already uh, based on the philosophy of, inspired by the philosophy of other Schopenhauer, as exposed in the world as view and representation. But I should say that, you know, although Sch Schopenhauer was surely pessimistic, I, I'm sure he enjoyed a glass of wine while he discussed this pessimistic ideas of, of the world, arguing that the world should not have existed. So this is quite interesting. Maybe we can have a sketch you know, of Schopenhauer drinking a glass of beer, a wine and discussing <laughs> the pessimistic nature of the world, enjoying the wine. Um, so now, uh, it is a fact that the number of artists in the world is increasing. And this is an interesting book. Uh, it shows uh, some famous artists on the cover, including Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. Ricky Jarvis is not in this picture. So this author, Ray Comfort, I think is attacking the, in his view, shallow uh, statements by the artists and the jury that's throughout. And Stephen Fry, a comedian, which of whom I deeply respect. I So actually Stephen Fry, uh, one time at the Bayreuth Festival, he was a tall man. I haven't spoken to him. Uh, I would love to. But anyway, he uh, he's a declared artist and he... Um, uh, have made this statement that, you know, why should there be in bone cancer in children? And why should the God, should God create a world in which there's such misery? So this is the argument put forward by 
Stephen Fry, you can take it or you can you know, think otherwise. But uh, these arguments about the nature of the world, whether it's an optimistic place or a pessimistic space, place, or whether it should exist or whether it shouldn't exist, these are really interesting uh, arguments that we can make uh, on the university campus. And this is what the university is all about. And there is this very famous um, early Christian who said, uh, credo ca absurdum. I believe because it is absurd. Of course, it is absurd to think that Christ, um, you know, came back to life after you know being crucified, and it is absurd. But uh, probably it's in the nature of religion to believe in the absurd. And uh, Yutaka Haniwa, uh, a Japanese writer and critic, uh, published a book called "Fugori uh, Yeni Wari Shinzu." Uh, credo queer absurdum literary and in which he discusses the discomfort of identity discomfort of being oneself so these are all wonderful uh, stuff and finally we come to the foundations of value in the brain and of course emotion is all about value judgment and value perception and we know um, you know, some neural circuits uh, in the brain which represent value. And nowadays, uh, in the field of management theory, uh, t they talk about corporate purpose. And, you know, it, it is perceived to be important to, for corporations to have a purpose. And this is a recent paper analyzing, as, uh, you know, different degree of perceived purpose, co corporate purpose, at different uh, hierarchical level of jobs. And so these are things that are really interesting from practical point of view. Uh, uh, at the same time, we should know that the meaningless, the ultimate meaningless of meaning, as beautifully uh, exposited in this PhD thesis by Takashi Murakami, of course, this guy, <laughs> a really famous contemporary artist. And uh, this was his PhD thesis at Tokyo Geidai. At Tokyo University of Fine Arts, and uh, you know there are people who are aware of the fundamental meaningless of the any meaning in this world, and so of course we are emotionally committed to meanings, but at the at the same time we should be aware that values are bottomless. I mean, there is no reason why there should be values as solid basis in, for things in the world. So everything is illusory. Uh, Douglas Adams, of course, is an uh, English author, uh, screenwriter, essayist, and he wrote this magnum opus, uh, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I love this. I simply love this. It's so breathtaking beautiful. Uh, you know, of course, uh, in order to cre uh, clear the space for um, highway in the galaxy, uh, Earth is demolished one day. So... Of course, you have to go out, and you hear the rumor that once the humans uh, asked a supercomputer to give the answer to the ultimate questions to life, the universe, and everything, and the supercomputer said that, well, we should come, you should come back in 7.5 million years' time, and when they come back, uh, the ultimate answer is 42. Ridiculous. Absurd. So wonderfully absurd. So the next question is, you know, you know, put forward to the supercomputer deep thought is, what is actually the ultimate question to which the answer was 42? So in order to calculate uh, the ultimate question, uh, the, the Earth, planet Earth, is set out as a supercomputer to uh, calculate that. But unfortunately, five minutes before uh, finishing this really long uh, drawn computation on the ultimate question, the earth is destroyed. What nonsense! What a waste of good intentions and what intellect and hopes and and how brilliant it is because this is the world we live in. We are living in it on this earth, but any time a meteorite might hit the earth and we might be gone. So. This is, uh, you know, human intake at its best. I really admire Douglas Adams. Anyway, uh, in memory of his great contribution to human culture, uh, you know, 42 is a free uh, 
イントゥーションあトゥーションフリーあノットイントゥーションフリーノースクールイズイントゥーションフリートゥーションフリーコンピュータープログラミングスクールインフランス and、uh, the US and now we have one in Tokyo thanks to Mr. Kamiyama of DMM so you know we have 42 in Tokyo so 42 is a magic number Douglas Adams、uh, you know kind of Uh, set before us、uh, as the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. So, in this lecture,、uh, we have 11 more lectures, 11 more sheer joy, I hope, and、uh, we would seek our 42 in these lectures. So, see you around.